think it is I, it is time or Jaco, did you have yeah. something urgent still no 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 i was just okay. about to say the same okay good so okay i hope everybody is hearing us so welcome to today's exciting session in in machine learning coffee seminar again and before we start i would like to remind that because there's lots of us so let's uh discuss how we ask for turns to speak. So Jaco has said that he will uh, be glad to get questions in the middle of the talk, but now that will result in everybody speaking at the same time unless we agree on, on how you ask for the floor. So there is a raise hand functionality in, in the Zoom for those who haven't used it yet. So if you click the participants button in the bottom of the screen, at least for me, it is in the bottom of the screen, you'll see a list of participants somewhere else on the screen. And there in the bottom, you have a button, raise hand. So use that if you want to ask a question. And then the tricky part comes that Jakob will not see those raised hands while he is speaking. So that's why I'm chairing. So I will then alert Jakob about those. Alternatively, you can put something to the chat and I will then again alert Jakob about those. But anyway, if there are any, uh, no questions on, on how to run this show, so then we very warmly welcome Jakob Lehtinen, a professor at Aalto University at, and, and at NVIDIA Research uh, to give us a talk that has a long title, and I believe that Jakob will explain to us what it means. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Sami, and thanks all of you for uh, for joining at this early hour on Monday. Forty-eight people. That's uh, yeah, that's that's uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, so, I work generally in the uh, with images mostly. So I've um, I've done research on image synthesis, uh, computational methods for uh, or numerical methods for solving basically radiation transport problems that uh, that determine that uh, govern light matter interaction uh, and and form pictures uh, that's to say computer graphics uh, for a long time but uh, in the past couple of years uh, i've also moved into the other uh, moved on to the dark side combining uh, machine learning techniques data driven techniques with uh, with traditional graphics um, approaches uh, in hopes of, of creating um, systems for that understand and can synthesize the world to a much, much greater degree than before. However, this talk is, uh, is on a very, very traditional image processing topic. That's to say denoising or removing corruptions from, uh, from images. And the point here is that um, while machine learning, usually uh, you, you train models for, um, for say, um, for denoising or, or other uh, other similar tasks, you do supervised learning where you have pairs of uh, pairs of data, um, you know, maybe something bad and something good, and then you teach a model to somehow map between these two. And this project is about learning to denoise when you don't actually have a reference of what good means, and you don't e you you don't have uh, even paired data. So you're just given single examples of bad stuff. What can you do with, uh, uh, in that situation? So the basis of, um, uh, of, of this work is, uh, is something that we, uh, that we published two years ago at ICML that's, um, that we called noise to noise, which is supervised learning um, for removing corruptions in images by still having paired data, so it's supervised, but we, uh, we learn to turn uh, bad images to good images by only looking at bad images. This means our training set consists of pairs of, uh, pairs of images that depict the exact same scene, but where we have two different kinds of corrupt, uh, two different corrupted versions of that picture. So for instance, two no, two different noisy photographs of the same scene. So the photon noise is different between the two images. Um, and so the idea would be that in situations where it's hard to get, uh, hard to get ground truth data, uh, like in uh, astronomy, various kinds of uh, biological imaging domains, um, where, but it's where it's easy to get lots, um, lots of bad data, you can then make use of that, uh, that bad data to, uh, to learn 
to remove that uh, remove corruptions while never actually seeing uh, what the good stuff looks like. And so the way uh, sort of a 36,000 uh, feet, feet view of, uh, of supervised regression for machine learning is you teach a model to say y when it sees x and you chain with pairs like this. Um, a classical denoiser um, algorithm would be you train with pairs of noisy images and corrupted good images, uh, sorry, corrupted noisy images and the corresponding good noise free images. Um, and you, you're basically doing a, doing a regression that says when you see a noisy version of this good picture, you should output that good picture. But in lots of situations, it's, it's really, really, really hard to get those good images. This is, a, this is an image that comes out of a cryo-electron microscope, and the signal-to-noise ratio is, is absolutely terrible. There is actually some signal in this picture, but it's, it's, hard, for even, uh, it's hard for us humans to, uh, to discern what that is. So the noise-to-noise -noise idea is, is extremely simple. Um, it's based on an almost trivial statistical observation that in, in lots of cases um, you can just skip, um, you, you can just replace the clean good image in, from your training, uh, training set with another uh, corrupted noisy version of, uh, of the same underlying signal uh, and provided that you use a proper loss function and so forth the model will actually learn to output the, um, the unobserved clean version of that signal if the noise has uh, some, um, some uh, simple statistical properties that we don't actually have to know ahead of time. So then instead of training with noisy and clean, you train, uh, sorry, you train with noisy and noisy. Um, you're basically telling the model when you see this, uh, output that. Which is which doesn't of course make any sense from you know when you look at this from uh, look at it from this naive point of view. So it seems like we're asking the impossible. However, it does work because if you think about uh, a corruption process that is uh, uh, that's zero mean, meaning that on average the images are correct. Um, your your gradient descent steps uh, on with clean targets look something like this. You run. Uh, your, your bad image through the model, you get the predicted image, then you compute the gradient, uh, and the gradient says, when, um, when you take a step towards the gradient, it says, how do I slightly turn the knobs in my model such that my prediction would become closer to the clean target? Now in the noisy world, when you get uh, multiple different conflicting um, potential bad answers, uh, if the noise has, um, is zero mean, then on average, the gradients that we compute uh, for, for these noisy samples, they actually point to the correct unobserved clean target. And then we can, uh, then we can do this uh, and, uh, and, and we can learn to, uh, to recover the original, uh, the original uh, or the unobserved uh, clean, uh, clean thing that we never saw. Um, there is some small print in here and I'm giving a simplified view. It's more general than, uh, than what I gave you, but uh, gave you just now, but it's, uh, this is the gist of it. So we can learn to denoise even if we never saw uh, good data. And we can do it just as well as if we had clean data and we don't further need to uh, need an explicit model of the corruption. Like we don't know, need to know exactly what kind, uh, kind the corruption is. We just need to know if it's zero mean or if the median is correct and, and so forth. And really all we had to do is show bad instead of good data during training. And this, if you do this, it can have dramatic effects on, uh, on, your, uh, on your results. This is uh, uh, work from others at the MPI in, the, in, in Dresden, where they apply, applied this idea to, uh, to cryo-EM. Just kept, you know, they, they figured, they uh, saw our paper, figured out that, okay, it's easy for us to capture this kind of data. They did it. and. Uh, and yeah, it makes, a, it makes a big difference. But so really the, the, the point of this talk, or this paper, is that having the, um, the, the, 
the requirement of having two independent realizations of the same underlying noisy uh, or same underlying clean signal is a big, big limitation. Think about Im imaging something that, uh, say, you know, you have living cells or something like that in your microscope, then needing to image them twice in a row. Um, you, you know, if there's movement in the uh, in the scene, can be can be very difficult or or impossible. Uh, you're thinking about something like a flow cytometry uh, device where cells are uh, are constantly moving. It's um, it's a taller order having uh, two of these uh, two of these realizations, and that's uh, the in in this work that we presented at NeurIPS uh, past uh, past December. Thinking about those crowds seems uh, kind of otherworldly right now, um, where we make further assumptions uh, and thereby buy the ability to get rid of the the, the training target altogether. Or more precisely, we use a single image as both the both the source and the target in the in the regression problem. And so, if all we're given is data that looks like this, there's no you know there's just a single image that's that's corrupted. There's no corresponding pair where there would be a different corruption. Then clearly, we need to make some further assumptions. You know, just looking at a bunch of data like this. Um, learning to denoise it is not going to happen unless we uh, unless we as assume something more. The classical um, image processing approach would be to explicitly say, okay, um, I'm going to assume that there's going to be some self-similar patches in this image, and then you, know, you can do non-local means or various other block matching types of things that search explicitly for these uh, these kinds of matching matching blocks and then take suitable forms of, uh, of averages um, in the image to, um, uh, to get your denoised result. Um, that's, uh, that is going to be our baseline. Um, but in order to apply the power of confidence to this problem, what we'll assume, uh, and I, I, I concede that this is a big assumption, we'll, uh, we assume that the noise is independent between pixels. Meaning that um, if, if I know the value of a pixel in here, then the noise um, or the, the, the corrupting process is independent between this pixel and that pixel. So that any correlation in the value between these pixels, we assume that uh, it's, uh, it's due to the unobserved clean signal under, under, uh, that, uh, that underlies that we're, that we're imaging. And we also assume that we know the noise model. Given the clean value, the unobserved clean value for a pixel, we, and, uh, we assume we know the distribution of the noisy, uh, noisy values given that clean value. So, you know, for, uh, for, uh, for Gaussian noise, we, we assume that's a, that's a Gaussian centered at the, at the clean value and, and, and so forth. And we can model lots of uh, real, world, uh, uh, real world noises in, in this way. For instance, in cryo EM, these assumptions ho uh, hold to a very good degree. The noise is independent between pixels, and we know that it's uh, it's Poisson uh, distributed. And that's to say, photon noise. And so, okay, let's let's look at the single <clears throat> single pixel in the output that uh, that we're trying to denoise. Now, if we don't, since we don't have any other information except this just uh, just this one pixel, then all we have to work with is the, the, the image itself, like the, the stuff that's around in the image of, uh, of, this, uh, of this target noisy pixel. And since we are going to be doing uh, supervised, uh, supervised learning or, or regression, we're, we're modeling this with, um, um, with, with a noisy context. That's the, that's the, that's the red thing. And uh, where we've plugged a hole in the target pixel, uh, and we call this uh, this hole the blind spot. And we're going to be trying to learn what we can say about the value of the of the target pixel when we look at the context uh, of uh, of that pixel without the pixel itself. And this is what uh, leaving this uh, leaving this blind spot is what's going to enable us to uh, enable us to do supervised learning on this. 
And so due to our assumption, the corruption in the target pixel and the context are independent. And this is something that we can work with. And the, the basic, basic form of this is, uh, or the basic idea here is that we can just do regular noise to noise style training, predicting the, the value of the central pixel by just looking at the context. And this has been done, uh, done before by, by folks at, uh, at, uh, at uh, the, uh, the Dresden MPI. Uh, the first thing we contribute in this paper is, a, um, uh, is an efficient new CNN architecture that, can, um, uh, that by construction has this uh, blind spot in the receptive field. Um, the, the, the German folks algorithm is extremely inefficient to train. Um, they, they, they basically need to extract separate patches from, uh, from images and then, uh, then modify the central pixels by, by adding noise in order to make the model disregard the central pixel. Our model um, can run um, or is, uh, our model is able to just take in a picture Run it through, uh, run it through a confnet using the full power of uh, of, of shared, you know, memory locality uh, and and shared computations in convolutions, and come up with uh, with an output picture just in a single pass. So this is this is one one of the things we contribute. I'm not going to go into the details of that though. So if we do this, how do we how do we do? Um, so with with two types of noise. Um, Here's, a, here's the result using, um, using um, a CNN trained using this kind of blind spot architecture where we predict the value of a pixel just by looking at its context, but notably not the pixel itself. However, when we compared to the, the fully supervised baseline that has, uh, has access to two pairs, uh, you know, uh, pairs of training data instead of just single instances, we, uh, we noticed that we get significantly better results, both visually and, uh, and, and numerically. And in, uh, in particular, we observe this kind of checkerboarding, pa checkerboard pattern. Uh, that's, uh, that's due to the fact that the model is predicting, uh, predicting values without just from the context, but without actually making use of the, of, of the value itself. And so how can we, the, the, the main contribution of our paper, I feel, is a way of, uh, of, going, of, of get, going around this, uh, this limitation. And so what are we actually observing? The, the training data, we observe pixels that, we, the, that are, whose distribution is governed by the underlying clean unobserved value and the context, of course. Um, and when, when we learn, when we do noise to noise uh, blind spot learning, trying to regress this from that, the model learns to, uh, to output the expectation of, of this given that, right? I mean, this is, this is simple, um, simple standard, standard stuff. Um, but notably, it does not use the noisy, um, the noisy value or the noise model uh, during training or inference. And because it's not using the, the observation at the pixel itself, it is, uh, it is not using all the information we, we want. So the training data that we actually see in our single corrupted images, um, we can, by using the, the, the noise model that we assume we know, we, we assume we know the distribution of the noisy observed data given the underlying clean, um, unobserved clean uh, thing. So this we assume we know. And this distribution of the clean uh, value given the noisy context, this is something um, that, uh, that we don't know, but that we're going to, uh, going to uh, going to learn. This is the marginal likelihood marginalizing over the clean values. This is, uh, well, this is just conditional uh, probability. Um, and, and we can write out our, uh, the distribution of our, of our training data like this. So now, the, the key idea here is that we're going to approximate, we're going to build a model that 
gives us a distribution over the clean values by looking at the, the noisy context. Um, we're going to be uh, approximating this with, uh, with the Gaussian, whose mean and standard deviation or mean and covariance are, uh, are determined by, by the context. Um, and, in, and moreover, we're going to implement this part as, uh, as a blind spot convolutional neural network. And because we approximate this uh, distribution with a Gaussian, it means that um, for many noise models, you know, for Gaussian noise um, being the, the simplest one, we can actually compute this uh, marginal likelihood in closed form, right? Even if the parameters of this approximate Gaussian are some very complex functions uh, of the context that are parametrized by a neural network. And because we can compute this marginal likelihood in closed form, we can actually back propagate through that, uh, that integral into the parameters of the CNN that, that give us this distribution in, uh, in, uh, uh, from, from looking at the context. So that's basically just uh, what I, oh, I guess I skipped ahead and just basically told you all of this. So I hope this makes sense. If this is a Gaussian, then for lots of, uh, lots of simple noise models, we, we can integrate out this analytically. And in particular, we can then back prop through it uh, and, and match that distribution um, with, uh, with the distribution of our, of our training data. The second key idea is that since we now, since we now have a model that's able to, uh, to predict the distribution of the underlying clean signal from the context, we can now use this, um, uh, this model at inference time to come up with, uh, with the Bayesian approximation of the, uh, or Bayesian uh, posterior for the actual pixel that, uh, that we're solving. Because when, when we're actually denoising a picture, we don't get just the context. We also have the value, uh, an observation of the central clean pixel. And this is just the just Bayes formula that the, the probability, the distribution of the, of the clean value uh, conditioned on the noisy observation and the noisy context is going to be uh, proportional to uh, to our prior that uh, that says something about the distribution of the clean given just the context and then the noise model that we know that uh, that that says how this uh, underlying unobserved clean thing gets gets mapped to this noisy noisy observation in practice to maximize the peak signal to noise ratio of, uh, of our results, we, uh, we form this posterior analytically at, uh, at runtime and, well, and analytically compute its, uh, its mean, and not the maximum, but the, but the mean. And this is, um, this is for maximizing uh, peak signal to noise ratio, which is equivalent to uh, minimizing uh, L2, uh, L2 error. It's a terrible metric, but uh, but that's what the denoising literature is uh, is uh, is uh, is based on. So so we we use that as well. So the um, the overall flow is then we train a model ahead of time to give us an approximation of the distribution of clean values given the context. At inference time, we run an image through our blind spot network. This gives us uh, the distribution, uh, a separate Gaussian distribution over the RGB values for all pixels in the image simultaneously because it's a continent. And then for every pixel, we form the posterior and compute its uh, mean analytically. And that gives us our final, um, final predicted, uh, pr uh, predicted pixel color. And so, if we compare results to the, the blind spot version, uh, blind spot network that's trained on single images, but that does not make use of the, uh, of the central pixel at inference time, we notice that we, uh, we get a, um, a much, much nicer result. So here's a comparison to, uh, in Gaussian noise, comparison to the fully supervised uh, model with, uh, with trained with clean data. Uh, it's very, very hard to see a difference uh, 
bit, uh, between uh, between these two uh, two results. So this is our our result on the right. Uh, same thing holds uh, uh, holds for for impulse noise. We're numerically slightly slightly worse in this case, um, but um, but still again, it's 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 very hard to see um, see any differences in the in the results. If I go back two slides. I hope it's visible in uh, even in the in the broadcast that um, that the, the model that does not make use of the central pixel at the at, at the inference time has has these issues with uh, with these kinds of checkerboarding patterns and so forth that are completely gone with uh, with the new model. So generally, we can say that um, the results are as good as the completely supervised confident baseline on additive Gaussian noise. On, uh, on Poisson noise, that's to say the, the kind of noise that, um, uh, that comes in, that you, that you see in digital images at, um, in the limit of low, uh, low intensities. So, so this is noise caused by basically individual photons hitting the, hitting the sensor. We're seeing that we're, we're almost as good as the, as the baseline. And with uh, with impulse noise is, uh, is is basically a stress test that we that we came up with. It's not realistic in any way. Uh, it's basically we we take every pixel, and with some probability we replace the value of that pixel with a completely uniformly distributed random number. This does not, um, or at least I don't know of any situations where this would happen in the <clears throat> uh, in the real world. But it's a uh, it's 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 a it's a good stress test. In there in there we uh, in in there we lose a little bit, but visually the difference is again hard to uh, hard to um, hard to notice. And and overall the results are uh, generally a lot better than classical denoisers like non-local means or BM3D, uh, both visually and numerically. Uh, what I'm happy about is that. Um, uh, these results um, also you know part of this uh, part of it uh, or these these ideas have been developed uh, further by uh, by other people as well including the the MPI Dresden uh, Dresden uh, team um, they are starting to catch on in uh, in in various forms of um, uh, of imaging in uh, in limited uh, limited data or diff other uh, other difficult uh, difficult contexts and I'm, um, I'm I'm quite happy seeing that uh, that yeah that the basically the ideas seem to uh, seem to be uh, taking uh, well picking up uh, momentum uh, the noise to noise um, idea where you have uh, where you do have do have supervision although with bad targets that seems to have started to permeate all all kinds of um, all kinds of imaging domains but we're we're also seeing uh, that uh, that this single self-supervised uh, methodology is, uh, is starting to pick up interest and, and, and speed. Of course, this is um, um, for an imaging, uh, imaging or graphics person having to make these, uh, these concessions about needing to know an explicit noise model and having to know the, the probability distribution of, uh, of of clean or sorry, noisy given clean, uh, and having to assume that the the noise is independent between pixels. These these are you know these are difficult pills to swallow for uh, for me personally. Um, what uh, what makes it easier is that um, that there are several important imaging modalities where where these um, where these assumptions hold. To a great enough degree that you can you can do a lot with uh, with with models that assume that uh, cryo EM being uh, being one of them. Um, we are interested, uh, of course, in trying to uh, trying to relax these assumptions. So thinking about what can we do with single corrupted bad images, where uh, when you know. What if the noise is not independent between pix uh, between the pixels? What if we don't know exactly the the probability distribution of, or the, the the distribution of of noisy given clean and 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 so forth? Um, and 
there are ideas to that front if you want to engineer uh, or to, towards that direction. If you want to engineer, you could think about first learning a noise model with some, um, some smaller data set and then applying that noise model. Maybe you, know, you fix the noise model and then, uh, then, then you learn um, the denoiser on, on a larger data set, something like that. Uh, but of course, any kind of uh, ap approach like that will face the trouble of, uh, um, of, well, I mean, you you still in order to train the um, the blind spot uh, model that predicts uh, the distribution of clean from the context um, will. Um, uh, you you still face the problem of uh, having to compute the the marginal likelihood that is to say to integrate the the marginal of the uh, over the integrate the uh, the product of the distributions over uh, over the clean values and this is something that uh, will we'll rely on the on the ability to do that analytically um, and and you know if we go to more complex distributions then uh, then we might lose that uh, that problem uh, one one sort of tangential um, remark about this is that peak signal to noise ratio or the pixel wise l2 loss is an absolutely terrible metric for uh, for image uh, for image restoration performance um, we really really should find something better uh, it's I, I think it's holding the entire field back but um, but uh, th this is something that's that's hard for uh, for a single single research uh, group to, uh, group to do. Um, so with that, I think I am I am done and uh, and ready to take questions. Thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot, Jaco. So there is one question already in the chat. So is is uh -huh. CNN is CNN a linear or nonlinear mapping? I suppose in this particular case. Uh, that's a great question. A CNN is a highly nonlinear mapping, so it's it's a it's a series of uh, of convolution learned convolutions uh, followed by by nonlinearities. So the standard kinds of uh, kinds of models we use in uh, in in deep learning. So something linear followed by something non simple and nonlinear followed by something linear, followed by something nonlinear, and, <clears throat> and, and so on. Okay, thanks. And as a reminder, so I will give floor to all people who ask, uh, raise their hands. So please find the raise hand button. Uh, so while you are thinking, I could ask, so how, uh, so it, it makes sense to me to assume that, that the noise is really independent between different pixels. I mean, that, that would be for many physical properties that would hold. But so uh, how badly would methods be needed where this wouldn't hold? I suppose if you have a grid that is too tight, then at some point you will st start seeing dependencies between those. So it's it's a delicate question. So even in even in situations like digital cameras that that basically record photons that land on on these photosites, it does not completely hold uh, <clears throat> due to various uh, various pesky uh, physical things that uh, that lead to current leaking between uh, between pixels. It's it's mostly true, but not entirely true. And if you if you want um, a really really high fidelity high performing model for just denoising photographs, I think you have to take those correlations into account somehow. Which brings to mind a good question: Can you do something in the regime where those correlations would be uh, exist but would be very weak somehow? I don't I don't know. Um, <clears throat> so other. Uh, other approaches or other modalities that that fall into the same generalized category of uh, of, of learning to um, remove noise from corrupted uh, corrupted images would be, for instance, MRI or magnetic uh, resonance imaging. This is so MRI basically takes uh, samples of the Fourier spectrum of the um, uh, of the volume that's that's being imaged, 
and it's uh, we we show in the in the 2018 noise to noise uh, paper that you can view reconstruction of undersampled MRI images in the noise to noise context. You can construct uh, things in such a way that um, um, that you can learn to well learn to infer what would be a fully sampled MRI image even if you're learning from uh, from just pairs of, of two severely undersampled MRI images and you don't really have you know fully fully sampled MRIs so in in that kind of situation the the corruptions are extremely dependent between pixels because the um, uh, the fact that you're missing some frequencies completely from the Fourier domain has has global effect on uh, on on all the pixels. But of course, this is this is already a slightly different uh, different domain. Yeah, thanks a lot. I, I could continue on that, but there are a couple of other questions. I'll bring them up first. Mm -hmm. So, have you compared the result with standard ways of doing denoising with two D Fourier methods? Uh, no, because those are strictly not competitive and have not been since the the 90s or 80s we we compare against the um, the, the standard bm3d method that's actually uh, coming out from uh, that uh, that that hails from tampere and uh, and that's considered the the, the sort of the classical state of the art um, widely available denoising technique there are some other techniques that gets slightly higher uh, signal to noise ratios, but uh, all our attempts to to get uh, a good implementation of those that would actually work on color images and not just black and white images have been unsuccessful. So we do compare to the what's considered widely to be the uh, the standard classical uh, classical technique. Uh, do you have some particular uh, like if the Whoever asked the question, if uh, if you have a um, a particular method in mind, maybe I can comment more. Leo, do you want to continue on this? That was Leo Kertainen who asked. So I was just thinking about the kind of quality of the denoising that you do. It looks very much like like just taking high frequencies out of Fourier transform. I can I can assure you that that this yeah, is very yeah. very far from the truth. Yeah, and, and then but that's that's because the eye is actually kind of it has its own on, on restrictions. Yes, sure. But this is also there is there's more to that story. There's all kinds of suppression and so forth. But this is um, this do, does touch the the point that uh, that signal peak signal to noise ratio is an absolutely terrible metric for uh, for measuring image quality in. Um, uh, uh, for, for well, in things that are meant for humans to look at. Okay, there's one more question: Is the training time longer than uh, noisy to clean approach? Depends is the answer. Um, if if you have a um, sort of relatively benign amounts of uh, amounts of noise, then you know not much. It uh, it doesn't really uh, doesn't really depend, um, or you know it's it's not significantly longer. The worse uh, the worse your data is, the, um, the 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 longer it gets. And you know at some point, of course, you you get to a point where it's uh, where it's impossible. Like I could come up with a scenario where you know, let's say <clears throat> my noise is such that. Um, Every pixel is, um, let's say, one one time out of a million, the pixel gets its correct value. But when it does, you know, I multiply its value by a million, and then all the other times, you know, it gets um, it, you know, it's set to black. The expectation is now correct, and I know the noise model, but no, no amount of uh, of, of training is going to actually allow me to recover uh, from 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 that um, that amount of noise since my my training images are going to be mostly black with huge spikes uh here and there and so you know it's it's a continuum where where the severity of the corruption determines um both training time and then eventual success at all all right any other questions we still have some time 
So, Jaakko, one thing that comes to my mind. So, what is the size of the context that you're usually using? Uh, so, it's uh, it's determined, we don't specify it directly. It's determined by the, the so-called receptive field of the confnet. We use standard three by three convolutions. Um, I think it's on the order of, you know, what should, what should I say? It's, uh, it's, it's on, the, on the order of 100 pixels, uh, both, both directions. I'm, I'm not lying too much when I say this. I, I don't have the exact number, but that's the order of magnitude anyway. And then, of course, the question is that when you tune it around, so you haven't been looking at what would be the difference. So changing the context, what would actually come out of that? Changing the, the size of the context, yes. you mean? So there is a difference, um, essentially. So. Yeah, we, we have not looked at that. We we're, we're using a model where the receptive field has been sized such that it works well for the, uh, the clean, the, the standard regression training with clean targets. Um, and so it's, it's not, you know, so we, we use a, a receptive field that's the smallest receptive field such that making it larger does not help the training with clean targets anymore. So that's the, uh, that sort of in our mind gets us, gives us, um, we, we shouldn't be needing more in, in, in any case. Of course, that depends on the type of images that you have. So, sure, of course, bars of course, on the we, sky are different than MRI. So, sure, sure. We uh, all of these models have been trained using uh, using image image debt data that's uh, that have, that has been uh, synthetically corrupted. But of course, if you were to say look at MRI or or uh, you know CT or something like that, then um, then one should be training with uh, with data that actually resembles the the one uh, the data you're going to be testing on. Although there are results that say that you can do surprisingly well, uh, say reconstructing MRI images, even if you've trained the model with uh, with with ImageNet, which is a little bit surprising, but 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 still true. Uh, I should mention one one final thing that. Um, the code is out there, um, so it's it's it should be uh, it should be easy for you to to pull it from GitHub and and play around with uh, with it. It's been packaged by our professional research engineer at uh, at Nvidia. The link is in the um, uh, on the coffee seminar webpage that uh, that has the abstract and so forth. All right, if there are no further questions, then let's thank Jakob warmly again. Thanks for a great talk. Thanks, Sami. Thanks, everyone, for attending, and thanks, thanks for the invitation. Thanks, Jakob.